Thank you. It's always surreal when you have these kind of lights at a science and health conference. So I'm going to try not to fall off the stage. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is actually something that pulls back on some of the panels we heard earlier, particularly about electronic consent, uh, and also some of the presentations we just had around design. Uh, I work at Sage Bionetworks. We're a nonprofit biomedical research institute. We spun out of Merck uh, eight years ago. And our mission is, is to quite literally investigate the way that the scientific method changes as we move into a more digital world. Because the way that we train most of our scientists and reward most of our scientists is to focus on the result. Did you get a nature paper? Did you get a science paper? And not to think about the actual methods that we use to do science. And we try to flip that script. We try to think about what are the methodologies that we can build and how do those methodologies let us do science better? And that's a very large concept of better. We talk about better not just in terms of productivity, but in terms of diversity, inclusion, ethics, collaboration, reusability, reproducibility. Because when you judge science on any of those scales, it tends to fail. The vast majority of what we publish is not reproducible. The vast majority of what we publish is not reusable. And when you compare science to something like software development, what you see is a culture where we're constantly reinventing the same wheels again and again and again. And in particular, we constantly fund research privately and publicly that we know will fail because we never shared the knowledge of a failure because all of our incentives are to publish positive results instead of good uh, negative results. Now, my talk is, is going to be more about design. And so generally at a health conference, people don't necessarily know what design is. And so I'm not talking about what something looks like. Graphic design, visual design is, is not what this is about. This is about behavior and thinking very carefully about how can we analyze problems in behavior and design solutions that actually help people the way they want to be helped. Not can we make a beautiful tool, but can we make a tool that actually solves the problem? And one of the phrases that we use at Sage is that an imprecise answer to the right question is far more powerful than a precise answer to the wrong question. So in many ways, design for us is about what's the question that we need to solve. Now, I, I lead the governance team at Sage, and I spend the vast majority of my time thinking about informed consent, data sharing, the benefits and the risks of doing this kind of research in digital health that you see back here in the, in the exhibit areas. And we, those of us that do this, we live in a very weird moment for privacy and research because around us, the entire technical and cultural environment has changed in about maybe 10 years. So I live in the United States, as you heard. Um, I use Facebook. My wife works there. I use the Safeway Club card to get discounts on my groceries. I use a credit card. I use an iPhone which means that I am constantly tracked and surveilled by digital systems. And it's really hard to understand how much I am surveilled until I look at what they see about me. So there's a website in the United States. We do not have the uh, general protections on data uh, regulation like you have in Europe. Uh, we have nothing. Right? Everything about me can be constantly transacted. There is one requirement. They have to let me log in and look at my data. So this website, aboutthedata.com, is a terrifying place as an American. And it shows you the granularity of what they let me see about myself. This is one of 17 pages that they have tracked me on. They know where I spend my money, how I spend my money. If I used a Google phone, they would even know where in the grocery store I spent most of my time by using my GPS tracking information. And this is primarily monetized to send me advertisements. Because if they know that I go to the frozen food part of the grocery store, they can send me a real-time coupon for frozen pizza. So we've basically given up all of our personal privacy in return for coupons for frozen pizza in the United States. What we're not doing is using this data for health. And we're not using these processes for health. It, we've built this gigantic, powerful machine, and we only use it for advertising. So a big part of our inquiry at Sage is, can we repurpose this system? Can we grab this thing that was built for advertising and repurpose it for health? And can we do that in a way that gives us more individual power, more individual agency, more rights? And we have to do that because the way we study health is terrifyingly weak. 
So this is a church in Detroit, which is a, a big city in central United States. I chose it because it holds about 2,000 people. Uh, we chose the 2,000 number because the largest ongoing study of Parkinson's disease, when we got into the space, everyone in the study would have fit into this church. 2,000 people. We make multi-billion dollar decisions about drugs based on sample sizes the size of a church. I have friends who work at Google. When they want to test something as minor as the language in an advertisement, they test it on the state of Nevada versus the state of Utah. One of them told me that they would never change something as important as advertising language with a sample size as small as a clinical trial, right? That's why we're here, is that everyone here sort of gets that we have to start getting larger and larger groups of people to study because we don't really know whether studying that church generalizes to you. If we study people in central United States and we try to come up with a drug and it comes to Finland and it doesn't work, there's a very good chance it's because we didn't have any people with Finnish genotypes in our study or Finnish diets, Finnish lifestyles. Right? We lose all of this when we have a very small, non-diverse sample size. But it gets worse. The amount of data that we collect from each of the people in the church is tiny. We see them one time per year in the clinic. And maybe we get two answers beyond that per year. One from a mail survey, one from a telephone survey. Does anyone here answer surveys anymore? We have survey fatigue. We don't live in a world where a survey is cool and unique. We live in a world where surveys are annoying and we dismiss them. So we have 2,000 people, three data points per year. And this is one of the big reasons why so many of the health studies fail. We simply don't have enough information. So several years ago, right, again, we're a nonprofit. We're trying to fix methodologies of science. We thought to ourselves, can we develop a study of Parkinson's disease that uses the phone? Because actually, for something like neurodegeneration, the sensors on a phone are very good. Right? The sensors that let you do your movies this way versus this way, let us capture your tremor. We can have you put the phone in your pocket and say, take 20 steps this way, 20 steps back, and we can tell whether or not your gait is irregular, your balance. By tapping on the touch screen, we can check your essential tremor and dyskinesia. With the microphone saying, ah, we know your muscle tone of your voice box as well as your lung capacity. So it's a condition for which the phone is remarkably well suited to actually measure it every day as you go along. And what's remarkable is that when you start to think about the phone this way, you can actually really extend the dimensionality of the information. So one of the core measures of Parkinson's is for dyskinesia. The, the doctor would have you tap on the table and give you a rating of one to five, one low, five high. Maybe if they were advanced, they videotape you and they count the taps. When you move to the touch screen, what you get is an explosion in the number of dimensions that you can look at. And this begins to reveal that the same medicine works differently in different people. Because not only are we doing this right with you know, much more sensitivity, but we can actually find things that were invisible because we weren't looking the right way. So I don't expect you to be able to see the actual graphs, but on the left, we have an individual who was findable by the old method. Not surprisingly, it's a man because the vast majority of our research is on men. So that's what we found. On the right, we find a woman where she didn't improve her number of taps, but her tremor declined, her accuracy improved. She got a benefit from the drug, but under the old measurement system, we might have taken the drug away from her because it wasn't working for some value of working. We can also start to get at lived experience, right? We have different days, right? I'm badly jet lagged right now. I got in yesterday. I'm also heavily caffeinated. My medicines are working differently in my body because of that. And our medical, most of our research systems don't capture that lived experience. And so what you see, this is one person, right, over the course of days. So from left to right is days chronologically. And what you see, these red lines are good days. These are days where the person in the study, their, their entire Parkinson's symptomology improved over the course of the day when they took their medicine. So the bottom of the line is before medicine, the top of the line is after medicine. And here in the middle, something changes in the interior two or three weeks. We go from steady improvement from morning to afternoon 
to some pretty bad days, some days where it gets worse from morning to afternoon. Those are the blue lines going down. And then it gets better again towards the right. What this is is a hypothesis about this one person that becomes findable because of the way that we analyze this. Now, this is the point at which I usually try to sell you a watch to monitor this or a phone. But that's actually not what I'm trying to do. One of the reasons we got into this was to change the culture of the way that we create these studies. The data should not belong to Google. Right? This is Google's uh, um, baseline study watch. Right? Google understands this. They want you in a Google study, and they want to own all of the data that are created. Our entire thesis is that if you're in one of these studies, you should own your data. It's about you. You should have the right to take it with you, send it to other people, send it to companies in the back, send it to academics here in Helsinki. Right? You should have the right to a copy of everything you do about you. You should have a copy of all of the research that comes out of it. And you should have a right to decide whether or not we can keep it secret at SAGE. And by getting into the field first, we hoped that we could actually create this as a cultural expectation for digital health studies generally. Now, um, my group is the governance group. We're like the least exciting part of the organization. Uh, because the, the fastest way to get an audience to go to the cocktail hour is to start talking about governance and policy and ethics instead of innovation. Now, my group was handed this project by the science team saying, we want to do this, but we want it to be ethical. Now, I was very lucky. I had been working at a design nonprofit that uh, practices a lot of the sort of interaction design and design thinking you've heard about today. And so we decided to treat this as an opportunity, right? not, a, not a moment to sort of get past, but thinking to ourselves, informed consent is actually the front door of this study. If you download our app from the App Store, before you get into any of the cool stuff, you have to consent. So how do we make the front door of the study informing ethical, engaging, fun. Because if you bring in people who feel like they were lied to on the way in, they will never come back. Right? The other sort of dirty truth about doing digital health is that you are now in competition with Facebook. You're in competition with Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram. People will delete your app off of their phone in a heartbeat. Right? They have no shame, no fear, they have control to a certain degree. And so you have got to design your opening process of your app better than you ever had to do it before. And no one who does informed consent is practiced at this. Let's see. Now, the other thing is that you have to, want to, you have to avoid the way that we do consent in consumer technology. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. But we pretty much treat consent as a roadblock, a piece of friction that should be eliminated to get into Snapchat or to get into Facebook or to use Google. And so we need to avoid that if we're going to get into this because we actually have a regulatory barrier. We have to create an ethically approved consent experience. And consent sucks in regular space. Right, so if you, if you do research, which we did on regular informed consent, that's to say not digital informed consent, it has enormous issues of comprehension, right? language style, reading level, the amount of time you're given, the format of the document. Has anyone here been in a research study? Right? I'm in four. Right? The average informed consent document in the United States is 17 pages long at 12-point font. And it reads at a graduate school level. That is not mapped to the average participant in a clinical study in the United States. Worse, all of these documents have to serve multiple masters. They're supposed to inform us and teach us but they also have to immunize the organization from liability, prove that they're doing their work on a regulatory level. It's too much for any document to bear. And what we found is something that, if we thought about consent as a software-style problem, as opposed to a legal-style problem, that there was technical debt. I'm willing to bet if we go to the major universities of Finland that they have document templates for informed consent that you are not allowed to change when you do a clinical study. We say, we know this document works. It works for the institution, right? Not for the individual or the scientist, but it works for the institution. And that's a lot like technical debt because nobody will change it. But what we also found was openness to actually thinking about using design as a way to create informedness before you show them the actual document. 
And so this is from traditional consent. When you bring it into an online environment, you have two additional challenges. The first is that we physically don't read on screens the way we read in print. And a number of studies have replicated this. When we look at the same document in print versus a screen, we read at most one out of three words on the screen. We scan in an F-shaped pattern. And what's interesting is if you look at Hebrew and Arabic speakers, they do the same thing but the other way because they read right to left instead of left to right. So this is a human impact of looking at screens. We don't really know why. But quite literally, we don't read what we think we read when we read on screens. So this is problem one. Problem two is that we've become accustomed to just clicking OK on legal agreements. Right? If there's an app I want to use, if I need to download an update to my Apple operating system, I don't read the terms of service. And this is an ethical problem that doesn't exist in traditional consent that exists in digital health. Did you actually check to see if they understood what they were signing up for? Because they were probably going to click OK anyway, and even if they tried to read, they didn't read. So what we developed was a process that said, we actually have to create friction. And this is the opposite of all consumer technology, the creation of friction. We have to put an interface in front of the consent document that slows down the eyes of our participants, that slows down the brains of our participants so they can actually think about the things we're telling them. Because we don't want them to come into the study unless they understand the risks and the benefits and they say, yes, I want in. So the idea is we create a pictorial tier, a text tier, and we actually make them take a quiz. And this is what it winds up looking like. So you say, what are the essential features of a consent document? What are the concepts we need to communicate before you enroll in a digital health study? Well, data processing is a pretty big one. And what you see is we have this triptych. We have an icon, what we call the headline, and the subheadline. And we know from, mainly from marketing materials in, in digital journalism that a picture, a headline, and a subheadline slows down the eye to the same speed as reading in print. We don't know why. The thesis is it has to do with trying to connect the picture to the headline. We know it breaks if the picture is not related to the headline. And we know it breaks if we put too much text on the screen. So this is the top level layer. We put very little stuff on the screen. So you can see you can go back, you can cancel, you can move forward, or you can learn more. And so we call this a layered consent where anyone who wants to learn more can get to a deeper dive of the screen. So this is our risk to privacy screen and a learn more screen. The semiotics are also very important. I had technologists who said, this should be a lock to show that everything is safe. And then I said, well, what if China attacks you? What if the National Security Agency in the US attacks you? Are we safe? Well, no. Obviously, a state actor can get in. Then it's not safe. It's not a lock, right? A red hand, on the other hand, culturally draws the eye and says, this might be dangerous. I should think about it. So all of these things have to go into designing your interface to make it as transparent and honest as possible. And then we ask you to take just a short quiz, right? This is not a complicated test. We're not trying to see if you're eligible for medical school. We just want to know, did you at least sort of understand what you saw? And in the beginning, we used this as an actual test. You had to get a perfect score to move forward. Now we use this as another teaching tool. So if you miss a question, we say, actually, the answer was, you know, this is not a treatment study. This is an observation study. And then we'll say, John, you got one out of five questions right. Are you sure you want to go forward? And then you can, right? Because one of the core principles of ethics is autonomy. You should be allowed to make that choice, but we have an obligation to inform you first. And so what you get is something that looks like a story about the consent document, a story about the study. And this is the way we expect someone to get informed enough to make a decision. Now, this has been the funniest externality. Uh, we've had several partners who didn't want to do this because it would show that they were giving very little back to the participant. They said, we don't want to show people what's in the document because then they won't join. We said, well, you know, then maybe you should design a better clinical protocol. Maybe you should think about your participant a little bit more. Because when you're going into a digital health world, they have far more agency, power, control over whether or not they enroll, and on top of that, whether or not they actually do the activities than they do in a traditional clinical research context. 
Now, we've taken this concept and tried to extend it beyond consent. Uh, we were very happy when we saw that this worked. We're like, where else can we do this? What else can we do with this as an idea? So one of them is sharing the data. Traditionally, if you're running a clinical study, you're the owner of the data. It's a trade secret. You can keep it to yourself. You can give it away. You can publish it. But it doesn't get shared with your competitors unless you want it to as the scientist. And we decided to put that power into the hands of the participant. So uh, this is a study that we operate but they have the authority to tell us um, that if they want, we'll share their data with the world. We have to tell them what that is and what it means. But interestingly, we now run you know, around 15 studies through our systems. A stable 70% of everyone that enrolls in studies donates their data to the world. As long as you offer this, it's amazing how many people accept this as the way they want their data governed. They don't want to keep it on their, you know, on their computer. They want us to provide it to the scientists for them. So we had to design a process for giving the data to data users. Because your average data scientist doesn't think about the terms of service either. Right? Your average researcher doesn't read the terms any more than the average participant does. So we make the participants, right, the data users, validate their identity. We make them take a test. We make them file a data use statement. They only have to do this once, right? Because once they've done this once, they get a passport that lets them access all the donated data from all of the studies that we create and integrate those data. But the big thing we developed as a part of this was an oath, right? We have an oath of do no harm in medicine. We don't have any do no harm oath in digital medicine or data science. So we make the data users download this, print it, sign and initial it, scan it, upload it, and it goes on their public profile page next to their real name in hopes that they will have actually thought about the conditions under which they got the data donated by these people. And there's a lot of sociology behind this. So you know, what I really wanted was to make you do a YouTube video swearing the oath because we know that the more sort of ceremonial the process is by which you take an oath, the more it binds people, the more effective it is. We also give everything away. We're a nonprofit, as I said. We want our methods adopted by the world. So we've compiled a library of hundreds of clinical icons that are at most under an attribution license, many of them fully in the public domain, semantically organized. So if you need a, an icon for something like blood pressure, you've got an icon for something like blood pressure. If you wanted to do something like this, you ought to be able to take our work and within the next day start building your interface without ever having to call us. We don't want your money. We want you to change the way you work. We give design layouts because many of you are going to work with a designer who has Photoshop. You need to be able to give them the formats and the templates and the layouts that they know how to work with so that they can get going as fast as possible all the way to the web templates and assets, at least in the US, a lot of the early stage developers doing this didn't even realize that, that advertisements for clinical studies had to have certain components, like what's the story, what's the study about? How does it work? Who's eligible? Who's running it? By providing the templates as open source tools and instructions on how to populate all the fields of those tools, we increase the odds that people who get into this and don't know what they're doing as much do it the right way from the beginning. And it's worked pretty well. So in the studies that we run ourselves, we've enrolled more than 100,000 people in three years. Um, all told, uh, when you look at the methods, that, the studies that use our methods, it's somewhere in the 500,000 range over those three years. Uh, we're in phase one, two, and three partnerships as a nonprofit with for-profit pharmaceutical and biotech companies who want to look at this this way. There's increasing evidence that if you don't engage ethically with your participants, they won't engage with you. So it's really kind of funny as a, as a you know, sort of hippie open source nonprofit, getting deals from the pharmaceutical industry and the biotech industry uh, is a sign that something here is working. Uh, all the way up to Apple integrating this entire consent process into their own research kit framework. And now 40% of the people who can commit code to research kit work at Sage. So this is a process, it's a methodology, but it's also a way of thinking that you can use when you go back to your own work, how do I actually integrate and engage with people through digital health? Even something as weird as informed consent can be informed by design. 
So I don't want to stand between you and a drink uh, any longer than I have to. But I want to think about where this is going. So we hear a lot about AI and machine learning. Does anybody here actually understand AI? All right, me neither. It's fine, right? This is the kind of picture AI is bad at. Right? AI is very good at finding patterns, right? These patterns look very similar to a machine because they have the same coloration and they have the same structural form. We as humans know that fried chicken and dogs are very different, but the machines don't necessarily know. And this is a funny example, but it's not a funny problem. Kate Crawford, who is someone who I admire enormously, talks about the problem with AI is a data problem. The training data that create these systems are the entire world of these systems. They don't know anything that we don't feed them. So they might never know that Labradoodles and fried chicken are different things. But it gets really scary when we start to apply this to real world problems. These are maps of American cities. Amazon's same-day delivery coverage of those American cities. The algorithms are blind to race. Now, I used to live in Boston. Boston's up here in the middle. You see that white pocket in the middle? It's the only non-white neighborhood in Boston. And it's the only neighborhood in Boston that Amazon doesn't make same-day delivery to. Because the AI systems tracked out structural inequality in the economics of that city and decided it wasn't worth economically delivering to those individuals in the middle. Health looks very similar. The social determinants of health track very closely to the social determinants of purchasing. It's even worse in the US. We're starting to use this software to predict whether people who've committed one crime will commit a second crime. And the software is incredibly racist and wrong. It generally says black people are way more likely to commit a second crime than white people, but when you actually map it against past performance, it's wrong all the time. It misses all the white people who commit more and more crimes. And this is what we have to prevent in digital health, right? That's what's coming if we don't actively intervene, thinking about ethics, diversity, and inclusion, making science better, not just digital. And so this is the project that I have spent the last year of my life working on, that my entire team works on. This is a federal study in the United States called the All of Us research program. One million people, 70% of whom are underrepresented in biomedical research, their genomes, their blood, their urine, their medical records, cell phone-based apps that let us use sensors, wearable devices, surveys, for 10 years. It's one of the only things that people agree about in Washington right now, is this program. We're very fortunate. And so these are the kinds of things we're going to make people do, right? In this 10-year period, plus the radical inclusion will allow us to prevent the Amazon bias trap, to prevent the machine prediction of recidivism trap as we go forward. Now, we're starting in a couple of months with these academic medical center sites simultaneously. We're moving that out to all the drug stores in a certain chain in the United States called Walgreens. And then over time, we'll even send people in vans to collect blood and urine and enroll people where they live. Right? This is an incredibly audacious project. And the goal is for all of this to use the exact same methodologies for consent that I just showed you. And so we have more money, so it's a little prettier. But this is an example of it's the exact same concept. This is the consent interface. Right? This is what the quiz will look like. It's more beautiful, but it's just a more precise answer to the right question. We started this by having the right question, which is how do we inform people, right? not how do we trick them into enrolling. We're going to be reformatting all of this because we're hearing from young people. They want to interface with the content via chat, right? SMS, uh, WhatsApp. They want to consent through the apps they live in already. We also hear from some of our older participants. They just want to watch the video and then take the quiz. And we're starting to see now the personas that emerge, the different types of participants that we get. Now, we do know that we're going to have to do different things for things like DNA. Because fundamentally, we don't want to know if you know what the letters D and A stand for. We want to know if you understand that what's happening is unknowable, that the risks are in many ways not yet known. Now, I'm going to stop, um, but I want to leave you with a metaphor which is it's very easy to just keep doing the thing that you did in analog world when you jump into digital. But this is why the right question is such an important thing. 
Because a lot of the stuff we've built in health, especially ethics in health, was never designed in the first place. Right? It was just iterations on stuff that we already did. And so mentally, right, our ears are very good information gathering mechanisms. They let you hear me despite the noise back there. So we might say to ourselves, well, then all we need are bigger ears. Right? I love this one. Right? But this is where you wind up. This is how the English listened for planes coming across the English Channel before radar. And it was fundamentally the wrong approach because it was answering the wrong question. Right? What they needed was radar. And as we move to digital health, ethics and governance, right, we don't need this. We need to think about fundamentally different systems that are appropriate to the fact that we're reaching into people's lives. Right? We're reaching into their pockets. We can even sometimes record them where they live. And they deserve better than this when we think about ethics and governance. And with that, I'll end. Please contact me, and I'm really grateful to have the chance to be here in Helsinki today. Thank you.